The Unshackled Waves, episode 120. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. As you will recall, we have previously done a show focusing on Victoria's African youth gang crime wave, where myself and associate editor of The Unshackled, Tom Peroni, went through the recent high-profile violent crimes committed by men described as being of African in appearance and discussed possible solutions. Given that this topic is very much still in the news, with crimes still being committed on a regular basis, we thought we would bring in an expert on the issue to explore how exactly we got to this point. So our guest today is Hayden Bradford, who is the founder of Protect Victoria, a new lobby group which is calling for the state government to overhaul the Victorian judicial system, introduce tougher policies around crime and youth detention, uh, the police being given authority to resume uh, proactive enforcement and to end the prevalence of courts granting bail and early parole. It is a state election year in Victoria, so uh, Protect Victoria are hoping they are able to put maximum pressure on both the state government and opposition to address law and order in their election manifestos. Hayden, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Tim. Pleasure to be here. Now, obviously, uh, African youth crime, it's been in the news for uh, the past uh, year, but it's really exploded over this uh, holiday uh, New Year period with a spate of uh, uh, violent crimes, uh, particularly in uh, Melbourne's West, and it's become a a national conversation now with uh, federal government ministers uh, getting involved. But uh, I'd like to take a step back to begin with and uh, allow you to explain how did we get here, because this didn't happen overnight or even over the past year it it's it's happened over the the past decade with the the introduction of various policies by uh, the uh, previous uh, state governments and uh, also the uh, approach of the judiciary and police uh, changing over that time it's good you touched on the three main areas there um the the problem we have with escalating violent crime, and that's what we do have in the state of Victoria, escalating violent crime, and it's going up every quarter when you read the crime stats. Um, it is the fault of um, government's soft on crime policies. It is the fault of a very, very lenient judicial system, which is full of civil libertarians. Um, and civil libertarians, I mean, they're, they're main focus in life is um, that people have the right to basically do what they want, um, providing, um, you know, and and it's the protection of their civil liberties. So they also believe that rehabilitation is a good thing for offenders, no matter how violent they are, because that will help them. And putting them away in detention or in jail is going to give them, um, um, you know, takes away their, their, their liberties, their civil liberties. But they don't seem to put too much emphasis on the poor old victims, mate. Um, the other problem is is that uh, police command, I mean, the, the, the Victorian police force has got a lot of problems. Um, the police command are unliked by the guys you see on the street. Uh, they don't believe that they're being well led. Um, they've been told they have to go softly, softly. There's emails that have got around from out of police command, which have said um, the uh, police officers on the street have got to teach, have got to um, um, approach people, particularly those who aren't, of, you know, aren't Australian born as an immigrant and refugee with a touchy-feely policy. And yet these are the people who are causing all the problems for us, particularly their youth. Uh, there, uh, last month, uh, there was the, the cr- uh, crime stats were released for Victoria and the, it was announced by mm. the police minister, Lisa Neville, who, sa- who said, you know, Victoria's uh, becoming safer. There's a 6% drop in uh, crime and this is uh, being run by, you know, media organisations who, you know, are trying to claim that, you know, the concern about crime in uh, Victoria is a, a beat up. Uh, what's the, the reality? The reality is that, that that is not true. The stats that Lisa Neville has used there from the crime stats that say crime is down 6% is it is the politicians fudging the numbers. The crimes that are down have been some property deception issues, uh, crimes, some fraud crimes, 
those crimes are down. But when you start to talk about violent home invasions, violent carjackings, violent assaults, those crimes are going up. Now, what is interesting too of late is that the Victorian police, and let, let, let's not sugarcoat this, let's call it exactly what it is. The main offenders of violent crime, when I talk about youth crime, in the state of Victoria are Sudanese youth crime gangs. They are there, they are in gangs, and for the government and the police to turn around and try and elude us that it's not really true, then quite clearly they're not getting around in some of the areas that I get around in. And uh, there's also been, you know, uh, in response to uh, particularly the comments of uh, Peter Dutton when he said, you know, uh, Victorians are scared to go out at restaurants at night, there, there's been a lot of, you know, smug, uh, mainly uh, inner city uh, people who say, you know, I went out for dinner last night, look, look how safe it was, you know, uh, you don't know what you're talking about. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's countless stories of, you know, uh, victims who have been the... Uh, been subjected to, you know, carjackings and terrorised by, you know, home invasions. There, there is a, you know, string of victims who basically the, these comments, you know, uh, show a, a callous disregard for. Yeah, um, I mean, look, you might be safe in Collins Street and in Melbourne going out for dinner, um, but how about, uh, what about all the people who were down in St Kilda there having dinner in those outdoor restaurants when you had something like um, 150 to 200 African youth running around belting them and robbing them and you know doing all sorts of assaults to them um, They weren't safe. What about the people out in the western suburbs of Melbourne? Um, you'd go out to talk to them. They don't go out for dinner. They're scared You go and talk to people down in you know, like our southwestern areas our southeastern areas um, They're scared to go out for dinner Right, uh, they're, and the reason they're scared is because their kids come home on the way home from school get beat up for their phones um, their parents who may be in wheelchairs and things like that get dragged out of their wheelchairs and assaulted and robbed. Uh, um, their homes get invaded, violently invaded. And when I use the term violent um, home invasions, I'm talking about these gangs of youth using, um, like the other night where there was 10 of them went in and there's a 50-year-old, 59-year-old uh, disabled woman and they built the living daylights out of her. Now they're armed with machetes, they're armed with knives, they're armed with lead pipes. I mean, so people are scared to go out. They are traumatised. They don't want to go out. So people like uh, Mr Peter Dutton are 100% uh, truthful what he's saying. There are people who are scared to go out. And, and if the, the, the government of Victoria and the police command don't, don't believe that, then they should come with me sometime. I'll take them out and they, they can talk to people who are scared to go out of their homes. Um, the, the comments by Peter Dutton weren't helped at all by you've got this then judge, uh, uh, Judge Lex Lazary, um, L-A-S-R-Y, who come out and said, oh, it's okay for me in Mansfield or something. I'm going out for, um, I'm having dinner now. It's all nice and quiet. For people who don't know Mansfield, it's in the, it's a, it's a regional town um, up in our high country in Victoria and um, nothing happens in Mansfield, mate, from a crime point of view because there's no crims living up there. So um, he was just being a smart aleck. Now, a couple of points to take from that, you know, the judiciary system should not interfere with politics. They're forever telling politicians to butt out. Well, they should do the same thing. And Judge um, Lex Lazary is a known um, civil libertarian judge. He's the same bloke who grants um, offenders who have um, been charged by the police for coward punches, uh, as what happened recently where a guy was uh, killed in, because he was assaulted in a coward's punch. A bloke walked up behind him and smashed him, and this guy died. Um, there's supposed to be a 10-year mandatory sentence in Victoria for, for um, those sorts of crimes. Judge Lex uh, Lazary gave this bloke uh, five years and bail of uh, or something, or he can get bail after four years um, and be released, sorry, parole after four years. So it's a, um, it's a bloody disgrace, mate. So he's just another civil libertarian. Yeah, when you hear comments like that from a sitting judge, it certainly doesn't uh, fill you with uh, confidence that the judiciary is taking their job uh, seriously. Now, one of the things I uh, found out uh, during uh, my research is that even when uh, these youth offenders, you know, go into, they don't go into adult prisons most of the time, they go into youth uh, detention facilities, that they're, mm. they're, they're not even dealt with, uh, you know, I wouldn't use the word harshly, but firmly uh, there. It, it's for some of them, it's like a holiday. Um, 
Look, I run up a while ago from youth detention centre ones, namely Malesbury and uh, Parkville, um, which, are, which, which are our big ones um, for for uh, male youths. Um, I spoke to ex-inmates from those centres. I spoke to um, current security staff and ex-security staff when I wrote that report, um, which is up on our website. But um, look, it's true, it is a holiday camp. It's referred to as a holiday camp. Um, and, a, and a classic way to prove that was uh, not so long ago, there was a person in court who was sentenced to um, Parkville and the response from the offender was, um, um, thank you, Your Honour, that's good. I like that place. They'd been in there before. Now, our youth detention centres in our jails should be places that are not liked, that you don't want to go to, because there's a very good deterrent not to do violent crime. Um, the other problem we have with youth detention centres is that the offenders of violent crime are weighted on hand and foot in a youth detention centre. You, you have um, they have breakfast delivered to them in the mornings to their unit. They get paid. I mean, I can't believe this. They get paid money. If they uh, get out of bed when they're meant to, if they make their bed, they get paid money. If they clean up their unit, they get paid money. Um, if they attend uh, a couple of hours of schooling a day uh, that's held within the uh, the youth detention centres, they get paid money. And it's called canteen spend, so then they can go up to the canteen and buy whatever they want. Um, the rapes of the younger boys is fairly prevalent. Assault in there is fairly prevalent. They spit on the guards um, and there's no the guards have no comeback. The guards aren't allowed to discipline them. They're not allowed to put them in solitary confinement, um, etc. So it's really, um, it really is a holiday camp. They get what they want. There were rumours going around a while ago, or stories going around a while ago, that on Friday nights the um, youth and youth detention centres get pizzas delivered to them. Um, that's partially true. Uh, that's Friday and Saturday nights that occurs on. But not only do they get pizzas delivered, they also get their they get a choice of McDonald's pizza or um, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, whatever they want. Now that's not paid for by them, by the way. That's paid for by us, the taxpayers. We're we're, we're footing that bill. Um, the other problem we have with youth detention centres is that um, if you come from a country like Sudan, um, a judge can send you to one of our youth detention centres for up. Uh, up to the age of you are uh, 24. So you can go in there, you can, can commit a violent home invasion and because you're from Sudan, the judge will send you, and you might be age 23, the judge will send you to um, a youth detention centre under what's called exceptional circumstances, which is a stupid thing that we have in our law in Victoria. And what that basically means is that um, if you come from a country where you're not familiar with the laws of Australia, um, then it's easier for you to go to a youth detention centre than to big boys jail. And we've had incidences down here where people, adults, have been sent to um, youth detention centres um, instead of to um, proper jails for, you know, excuses like um, um, this particular person didn't, didn't know it was against Australian law to assault a woman on a train. He ended up in a um, youth detention centre. Um, other excuses like um, at the time he committed that violent home invasion, uh, they were on the drug ice. These are just stupid exceptional circumstances that a judge um, can use to send you to a youth detention centre up to the age of 24. Uh, now we're told uh, uh, when you know obviously you and I were you know calling for the state government to you know get tough on law and order, but there's you know all, always all these people you know in the the government and in the media saying oh you know it's a lot harder than you know just populist uh, solutions. Uh, but you've actually put together a list of you know practical uh, you know pol policy solutions that you believe you know will be effective in you know uh, you know making uh, the streets of uh, Victoria safe again and making these criminals, you know, actually, you know, fear consequences. Yeah. Um, look, first of all, we, we need to drop back a couple of things, uh, jump back a couple of years. The current state government that we have in power, the Daniel Andrews-led ALP government, was elected in November of the year 2014. They took over from a Liberal government. Now, um, one of the first things that Daniel Andrews did was that um, in early 2015, he reduced the law which was introduced in uh, 2013 to make it an offence to breach bail. Right? What Daniel Andrews did is he said, if you are a youth and you breach bail, then that law is now decriminalised. So in other words, if you're 
a youth offender, you've done a violent carjacking, um, you're 17 years of age and you're put on bail um, and you breach that bail, there can be no other offence added to your record. Tom? So you can breach bail, for example, like a young fellow did some time ago, on 78 charges, um, he breached his bail 11 times. They couldn't, all they could keep doing was the police arresting him, putting him before the magistrate, and the magistrate allowing him to walk um, because breaching bail for youth criminals is um, not an offence anymore in the state of Victoria. Um, so they decriminalised um, the breaching of that bail for anyone under the age of 18. Um, and yet the law was already there that if you breach bail, you've got to be, you know, you've got to face a custodial sentence for it. So one of the, one of the things that I've found um, in what I'm doing um, is that... Um, on average, for a youth to be sentenced to a youth detention centre, they need to have committed four violent home invasions, four violent carjackings, um, four violent assaults, well, four assaults, there's no such thing as a nice assault, um, or a combination of, of all of them. But they, they, they need to have offended violently four times. On the fifth time they do it, they will go to a youth detention centre. However, for the first four times they do it, they will get bail, they will get youth community, um, sorry, they'll get bail, they'll get um, a community corrections order, they will get um, uh, youth supervision orders, which I, I don't fully understand what they are. All it means is that it's like bail, you just got to go and report somewhere once every now and again. Um, we saw this recently with a bloke who um, stabbed the police officer, um, a young fella, he stabbed the police officer. He was given 200 hours community... Um, service that's a load of nonsense if you stab a police officer you should go to jail you stab anybody go to jail you know whether that jail be a youth detention center or a hardcore jail but this guy was a youth so a youth detention center see there's there's, there's 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 and you hear this a lot down here now there's there is no deterrent to violent crime in the state of victoria for youths none whatsoever look at all those guys um who did those jewelry robberies um, we recently had a judge, there, there was, they attacked jewellery stores and um, um, with machetes, with axes, sledgehammers, frightening the living daylights out of um, the staff, threatened the staff, etc. One of those blokes who did that, the head guy, um, he was, um, they were all suing these kids, of course, um, and they were selling the jewellery that they got, um, and they had a, a fence, so to speak, who they were selling it through, and they, the police have arrested this guy. Um, but the head person of that, the gang leader, so to speak, he recently applied to go overseas on a holiday. Now, he's on bail. Now, he was granted permission to fly out of Australia on a holiday by a judge in the state of Victoria um, while he was on holidays. I mean, to have a holiday while he's on bail. There's something fundamentally wrong with what's going on here. If you're on bail, you don't go anywhere. But not in the state of Victoria. So um, that's, um, it was a female judge, um, I just forget her name now, I've got it written down here somewhere, but um, I'll be naming her and shaming her at our rally on February the 11th, but she was also the same judge that um, recently, um, or late last year, um, sent a Sudanese youth, sorry, Sudanese adult to jail for some fairly horrendous offences. And um, she apologised to sending him to jail, but said she had no option. I mean, you don't apologise to criminals, mate. <laughs> it seems that what's led us to this crime crisis is that, um, you know, the judiciary still seems to, you know, do what they want, even if their, you know, uh, laws are passed and they're, you know, directed by the government to, you know, pass, you know, certain senses sentences they still uh you know d d do their do their own thing and uh the problem is is that these you know judges and magistrates they're you know appointed for for life there's no real you know accountability uh you know for the the sentences uh they hand out so how how can that be fixed yeah i mean you're quite right judges and uh, magistrates in the state of victoria don't answer to anybody um under the separation of powers law it is um um, totally ridiculous. But look, one of the things that 
that we think um, would help would be um, get rid of this, um, and the government can legislate this, get rid of this nonsense that they have a job for life. Well, actually, it's up to their age 70 or 75, I think it is, and they have to retire. But get rid of that nonsense. What we should be doing is we should put all of our judges and magistrates on contracts. Uh, those contracts should only be 12 months long. Um, and then an independent body should then do a performance review on the judge's performance throughout the year. And if it's not up to scratch, then the contract is not renewed. Um, that is a that keeps the judges on on their toes. It also makes them accountable to at least an independent body for their performance. Another thing we can do is that um, um, magistrates and and and, and um, judges who fail to take into account in the sentencing of offenders, they they fail to take into account the damage done to the victims, then um, those magistrates should um, also be removed from the position because we've got uh, going on in Victoria, it just strikes me at the moment that the magistrates and judges are more keen on um, the welfare of the offenders and what they are of the actual victims and that's fundamentally wrong. You know, our, our law courts should be dispensing justice with the victims in mind, um, not the offenders. Um, there also needs to be some sort of um, law put in place where um, judges and magistrates huff to to adopt a um, community it has to sentence in accordance with the duty of care uh, to the community, understand community expectations, and maybe victims of crime need to sit down once a month with all of our, or once every six months with all of our magistrates and judges and say, um, listen, this is what these people have done to me. And you keep giving them bail to go out and do it to other people. That's not right. Um, please understand that we want to be protected in our homes. Um, the other thing we can do is that um, I think that it would be a good thing for juries to be able to um, actually sentence offenders instead of judges and magistrates. Now, if you have a 12-person jury, which is called a jury of your peers, and you are on trial for, say, conducting, um, beating up people with lead pipes and conducting a number of home invasions or whatever the case may be, then the judge should offer advice to the jury on what their sentencing options are, but the jury should make the call on what the person should be sentenced to because the jury actually knows more about what's going on in the community than our judges and magistrates do. The suburbs they live in um, probably don't have any crime. You know, your Turax and places like that. So, um, yeah, look, I, I think that's one way. And, and by doing all of these things or introducing at least a couple of those things, we're sending a very clear message to the judicial system that we, as the public, we've had enough. Now do it. Look after us, don't look after the offenders. Who cares? Uh, now, a lot of people who are, you know, calling for, you know, tougher and law and order are, are you know, uh, and you've spoken about this yourself, that, you know, the police, you know, they want to take a, uh, you know, harder line, uh, you know, but they're, you know, constrained by, you know, what the, you know, government allows them to do and also what the uh, police uh, leadership has to do. And a lot of people are, you know, also uh, holding accountable the police commissioner, Graham Ashton, who, you know, seems to, you know, be adopting the, the government line on, you know, or, you know, we're, it's only like a small you know, percentage of the community, you know, don't call them, you know, gangs. Is there, is there f things that can be taken, you know, at, in the police force to, you know, help them, you know, better, you know, enforce and, you know, ma make sure that, you know, these crimes are prevented from happening in the first place? Yeah, one of the first things we should be doing is um, we should be appointing a Victorian police officer who's come up through the ranks, who understands what police work is all about in the state of Victoria, um, and make that person the police commissioner. We've suffered in the state of Victoria. Our police force has suffered from um, the current police commissioners come from the federal police. Prior to that, uh, the previous police commissioner, Simon Overland, he come from the federal police. And prior to that, um, the then police minister, Christine Nixon, was picked up out of some little place in New South Wales and brought down here. We should be appointing Victorian police officers. Um, you know, as I say, they've come up through the ranks, they understand policing in Victoria, what's needed, what's required. Um, 
the police commissioner should go in there and be appointed knowing full well that he is not a yet or they are not a yes person for the government at the moment i mean nixon um Simon overland and graham ashton are quite clearly um yes people for the government um now those sorts of um the comments that i've just made there that, that's not my ideas or anyone in the group's ideas that's come from police on the street um because they, they have a big problem with uh, their police command over a number of reasons but um one of the ones is you know get a victorian copper in there to run it um You'll also find that um, a number of police officers who are members of Protect Victoria will tell you that um, they actually have to sit in police stations and wait for the jobs to come in. They don't have that proactive policing ability anymore. They're, they're more reactive. That annoys a lot of the police officers. So we need to go back to proactive police officers. I mean, if I was going to go rob a bank or... Um, knock over a jewellery store, and I saw a couple of police officers walking around, I'd be thinking twice about it, right? So why wait until the jewellery store's been robbed? Why not have police just walking around the area? Um, and if we don't have enough police to do that, then get more. Um, the police too, particularly when it comes to dealing with um, uh, Sudanese uh, youth crime gangs and Sudanese youth crime, um, the police have been ordered by the Victorian uh, government that they are to adopt a more softly, softly approach with these people because they don't want to be tarnished with um, the fact that they're targeting the African youth crime gangs, whereas it should be, it doesn't matter what the colour of your skin is, if you commit the crime, the police should should deal with you the same as they would deal with any other person who committed the crime. So if they've got to roll you over in a very hard way to put handcuffs on you because you've been running around with a the machete, then uh, they have every right to do that. They shouldn't have to ask you nicely not to do it, you know, and to, and to do the right thing and to roll over. They should be able... This is why our police gets spat on by the youth and abused and all this sort of nonsense, you know. Um, during the Burke Street massacre, uh, it, it became very apparent that um, the police officers on the scene um, went to their police command on six separate occasions and asked for permission to take the offender out. Um, now, by that, they meant ramming his car or possibly even shooting the guy. This is the same guy who went on and killed six people and um, injured 30-plus. Now, six times that they requested permission, they um, they were denied that permission by police command, and, and, and this is nonsense. Had the police officers been allowed to take that guy out, we would not have had the deaths that we had, um, and particularly to those two kiddies that I mentioned before, two young kiddies that I mentioned before. Um Police command should be just turned upside down and thrown out the door, right? Sacked a lot of them. They're, they're, they're no good. Get, get more people in there. A police officer, to the best of my knowledge, has done something like um, about eight months um, basic recruit training um, before they're let out on the streets. I don't know how many years of experience or how many specialist courses these police officers who were first on the scene um, had between them, but quite clearly it's embarrassing for the Victorian police for them to have to go back and ask permission to stop a crime from occurring. Right. Um, nothing's changed in Victoria from, from that point of view, by the way. The uh, police command still, you know, the police have still got to go back to the police command and ask permission to stop a crime occurring. This is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Um, it wouldn't happen in any other country that I'm aware of. Um, they should, um, within the police department, there, there should be a specialist like IT area that actually monitors your Snapchats, your Facebooks, your um, Twitters, your social media, because some of these um, Sudanese youth crime gangs, they, they, they've got youth crime people, they've got so um, brazen that there's photographs of them on face, Facebook with their stolen jewellery and the weapons they've used, I mean, um, and stolen cars and uh, the weapons they've used. And if the police were monitoring these guys, and, um, and these guys are using their real name, by the way. So if the police were monitoring these guys, and surely they could go straight around to them and say, come with me, Noddy. But they don't. I don't know why that is. I think that also all schools should adopt a, um, adopt the COP program, primary schools, you know, so that we can start to build up this relationship between the police and, um, and people. Because currently in Victoria, what I'm seeing is that uh, people have lost faith in our police force, and that's unfair, but people have lost faith in our judicial system. That is very fair. I mean, the police keep arresting these people, and despite what Graham um, Ashton, Commissioner Ashton, said the other day, the police aren't locking them up because the courts won't allow them to do it, right? They're letting them out on bail. Like, 
Uh, I was talking to a police officer the other day and he said, oh, yeah, they get bail and we know that within two weeks we're going to be arresting the same person for the same offence. And it will go on until they've committed about four of these violent crimes. Then they'll get sent to a youth detention centre, the holiday camps. So, you know, these are little changes that we can make. They don't cost any money. And we can make these changes um, and we can say, well, you know, this is going to tighten it up. It's going to make things a little bit more secure. I mean, I remember as a kid, we always had a doctor cop program when I was in primary school. They'd come around and... Some of them would get out and kick a footy around with you once a, every couple of months. They'd talk to you about, you know, riding your bikes and wearing, sort of making sure you wear helmets. They, they, they weren't talking about violent crime or anything, but they were adopting this, um, hey, police officers aren't bad. And they're not. The overwhelming bulk of police officers in the state of Victoria are really, really good people and um, good men and women. And um, unfortunately, we've got a very high attrition rate within our Victorian police force at the moment because, as I said, they keep um, arresting these offenders and the courts don't back them. So that, that needs to change. And now what's uh, occurred uh, since uh, this issue burst onto the national political scene is uh, a lot of uh, blame game between the state and federal government. Mm. The, the Andrews government has said the federal government you know, should fund the, the national criminal intelligence uh, system. They shouldn't have uh, cut the federal police uh, last year. Uh, is, is there action that can be taken at a federal level which would make a difference? Yeah, the first thing the federal government should do, I think, is say, um, look, we'll pick up all this violent youth crime in the state of Victoria. We won't worry about the uh, Victorian judicial system because you guys are all out on the happy grass or something. Um, you, you don't fully understand um, um, what it's like for the victims when they're carved up with machetes and they're beaten with lead pipes and they're sort of assaulted and um, called all sorts of names. Um, look, the way our laws work at the moment, the state government's responsible for law and order. Um, in Victoria, the state government has failed and that, as have the judicial system, as have the police command. So there is um, a very small role for the Victorian, uh, sorry, for the federal police or the federal government to put forward in that, um, or to play in that, yes, a criminal database would be good, but in Victoria, they will have a, say this criminal database went in, in Victoria, because um, of our soft on crime laws, especially for youth, you'll find that youth offenders won't be entered into it. Um, in uh, 2014, the Victorian police were given $600 million worth of um, taxpayers' money to do something about this escalating violent crime within our youth. Um, they should give the money back. It hasn't worked. I mean, whatever they've done hasn't worked. The police minister was on TV the other night banging on about we've done this and we've done that and, you know, we've given the police all these all, all, all this money, $600 million for um, all this detection equipment. Well, it's all very well to be able to detect the criminals, but the point is you've also got to be able to arrest them. You've also got to be able to get them into the courts and have the court system support the police and say, um, no, we're not going to give you bail, mate. You can go and remand till we hear you. And then when the charge is handed down, or the conviction's handed down, then the person should be going to jail. I mean, you know, can't carve up somebody in the state of Victoria or anywhere in Australia with a bloody machete and expect to be given bail for it and a light sentence. You know, you, you, you've got to send a clear deterrent to these people. Um, so that's $600 million. Um, yeah, that was a waste of money. There's no doubt about that because they were given that in 2014. That, sorry, 2016, I made a mistake. 2016, there has nothing um, escalating youth violent crime has gone up and gone up and gone up. A new term we hear down here now is, of course, um, violent, uh, sorry, repeat offenders by youth. Um, well, the reason that they are being repeat offenders is because there's no deterrent to youth violent crime. So the police will tell you, the guys on the street, um, so to speak, will tell you that they'll go before a judge and they'll say, look, don't give this guy bail because he smashed somebody around the, around the head during a home invasion or a carjacking. Um, and by the way, we think he's also got weapons somewhere um, and or firearms. And, and, and the judge will say, no, 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 we're going to give him bail. So the, judge, the judicial system doesn't even listen to the poor old police prosecution, which um, sucks. <laughs> 
Now let's talk about your organization, uh, Protect Victoria. Now you're the uh, founder of it, but who is the the organization uh, made up of? Like, is it made up of you know already um, established political activists, or is it more of a grassroots organization? I refer to Protect Victoria as a um, as a peaceful people power movement. We um, have something like 34,500 people who are members of it on a closed Facebook group. Um, we also have a public page. But the reason we keep it a closed group is we like to vet people so we don't get political animals in there or racists, etc. Um, one, what we are, I think what's attracted a lot of people to us is that we're, we're not a political group, we're not a hate group, we're not a racist group, we're not an anti-police group. Um, we don't favour either side of politics, all we want done is we just want the safety and the security that we once had in Victoria given back to us, right? That's been taken away. We just want it given back to us. You will find that um, on the site there's, um, well, you're speaking about the Sudanese, that there's a number of Sudanese people involved in the, on the site. There's It's a very multicultural site, so to speak. Um, and basically it consists of just people who are really, really concerned about the high levels of violent escalating crime. There is uh, some victims on the site, and man, will they tell you some um, really harrowing stories. Um, as a result of that, 34,000 people, we've had comments on lots of number of things, different documents and that. We've been able to pull together what we call um, our policy initiatives. Now, those initiatives are up on our website. They're also on our Facebook site. And these are the things that we think can help us um, help the Victorian government and um, the Victorian judicial system to rein in violent youth crime in this state and, and do what our taxes are meant to be doing. You know, we're paying to be protected, so do it. Um, I started it off after the, what I'll call the Burke Street Massacre, um, because there's a prime example of a breakdown in law and order, right? Um, a government had reduced, softened our bail laws as a result of that. A volunteer bail justice gave a known repeat offender bail um, he went out on the street in a car, um, ran up the sidewalk, killed six people, um, injured 30-odd plus. Um, what horrified me most of all, and I do say this with all due respects to the other people who were killed, but in amongst those six dead was a 10-year-old girl called Tyler and a um, three-month-old baby boy called Zachary. I mean, it's just it was unacceptable to me that parents have to bury their children because of faults with the judicial system and the government, and that's exactly where the problem sat. And not one of them have bothered to apologise to the victims. That's just, that's just simply wrong. Yeah, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, in this uh, political environment, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, just before that, you know, you're not a racist organisation, but, you know, you're obviously going to, you know, be accused of, you know, uh, racism and there's all, there's going to be all these, you know, uh, other, other smears because uh, despite, you know, Daniel Andrews, you know, talking, uh, uh, you know, trying to talk a, you know, a bit tougher on law and order, you still have, you know, large segments of, you know, the Labour Party and the left who, you know, claim this is all, you know, motivated by racism. Mm. Yeah, well, my, my response to those people would be, um, come with me sometime, I'll take you around the western suburbs of Melbourne. You'll actually see the gangs. Um, they sit in parks. Um, uh, the police go up and ask them what they're doing, and mind you, the police have to go up there in large numbers, and our police get spat on. I mean, this, these are Sudanese youth gangs out of Africa. Uh, whether or not they emigrated here or whether they're second generation, first generation or whatever, are Australians, the point is, is that they um, they are certain these youth gangs. Now, you've got to call them as you see it. Um, there are, if, if, if you look at the facts, the facts are that the overwhelming bulk of crime, violent crime, um, home invasions, carjackings and assaults in the state of Victoria are conducted by Sudanese youth gangs. Um, and I say youth. Right. If you look at um, the majority of rapes, murders, um, uh, drug trafficking, all that sort of stuff, the majority of those crimes is conducted by white people, white Caucasians like me. Right. So, I mean, all we're doing with the youth crime things is calling it as we see it. Right? And some of these certainly the youth gangs are, are, are relatively stupid because they're working for... Um, uh, fences, you know, like they go and knock off motor cars, they knock off jewellery, they knock off uh, credit cards, etc. Um, 
those are sold onwards and upwards to um, other people within the chain. Those people are adult white Caucasians um, that are, um, you know, they might give somebody, um, a couple of gang members, a um, $2,000 for a made-to-order Audi that they want. Um, that Audi will then be um, um, passed on to this, this gang, this crime gang, white crime gang, by... Um, the young Sudanese youth boys, they'll get two grand for that, and these guys will on sell the car. You know, they'll go and um, do what these blokes do, change engine numbers, change number plates, remodel the car a little bit, and they might get, you know, 100000 bucks for it. So the Sudanese youth gangs are, uh, you know, are losing out. And, of course, the, the victims of, you know, crime, uh, you know, they, they're made up of, you know, people of all different races. I mean, I, I saw uh, a news report the other night. It was a, uh, a family in Dandenong. They were of Indian background. And, you know, they, it's fair yeah. to say, you know, when you're a criminal, you know, you, you just target, you know, who you think, you know, you're going to, um, you know, uh, uh, steal the most, you know, items from or, you know, terrify the, the most, you know, you're, you're not thinking about race. Right. Mate, Sudanese youth gangs actually and conduct home invasions and carjackings on Sudanese adults, right? I mean, they they don't care. They just um, go where they think they'll there's, there's a soft target, so to speak, and get what they want and get out. Um, they don't care if they carve up their own people, and they have. They have. There's a Sudanese guy. Um, uh, just forget his name now, but he was um, he was attacked by a Sudanese gang and. Um, they had machetes and they, they carved him up fairly severely around the head with these machetes, right? I mean, these are terrible, terrible crimes. But it was a Sudanese person. So they they attack all people, but, you know, being the state of Victoria, being Australia, it is predominantly white people and therefore predominantly white people are going to get attacked. But yes, you're right about Indians. The Sudanese have attacked a number of Indian places. Um, um, and I keep saying home invasions and um, carjackings and um, assaults, but we also should remember too that a number and a lot of business invasions have also occurred, like news agencies, like 7-Elevens, like um, uh, service stations, etc. And some of those people, um, they're they're not white Caucasians; they're of you know multicultural country; they're of different races, and they get attacked too. They, they, they don't care these youth crime gangs. And Protect Victoria is wanting to stay focused on the uh, the crime issue. Like, you, is it fair to say you have you know members of your organisation who you know have a diverse range of views on you know other political issues? Like, they wouldn't you know classify themselves as you know the buzzword is you know far right. You know, they you know, they might on you know other issues you know have you know socially progressive views, for example. Yeah, look, we have um what thirty four and a half thousand members. It's growing all the time. Um. In a group that size, you are going to have people who have got far right views. You are going to have the odd racist. You are going to have people who have got far left views. But what we do is, um, when somebody makes a comment that's against um, us, like you know, starting vigilante groups or something like that, or they make some racist comment, then those comments are removed pretty quickly um, by the administrators or the moderators on the site, and the person who made them is also removed. So. We want to keep it very, very much the group of concerned citizens. Um, we're not going to go. I mean, I don't know what I am. I don't know whether I'm far right, far left, centre left, or bloody running around in circles. So I, I have no idea. And I have no idea, to be honest with you, what the people in Victoria, Protect Victoria, would vote. I mean, I, or, or how they would vote. Um, it's, it's The voting thing is up to them totally. We, we, we don't suggest that people should vote one way or the other. We just merely put the facts out there. And... Um, People will make up their, their own mind about it. We um, will be having our first ever rally on um, Peaceful People Power Rally, I call it, on February the 11th. The event details for that are up on our website, which is uh, www.protectvictoria.org um, or on our closed Facebook group. At the moment, um, it's only been up for a couple of weeks, I think, but at the moment we've got a fairly large crowd who have committed to coming. Um, I'm working um, and have worked with the police. Um, I happen to know the person, the police inspector, who's in charge of public order forums. Um, he's, he, he, they'll certainly be looking after us to make sure that there's no troublemakers turn up. And if they do, they're removed very quickly. However, I would not expect any trouble from any far right group or far left group because we are purely an anti-crime group. We're not into politics and um, um, all, all of the other stuff that the far right 
might be into or what the far left may be into. You know, we're, we're not interested in, in all of the other issues. We are purely an anti-crime group and we want the safety and, 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 and security that we once had in Victoria given back to us. Now, if Daniel Andrews and his government aren't, isn't going to give that back to us, then quite clearly people will probably vote against him and his government because of that. Um, but, you know, as I say, as far as all other issues go, whether they be issues on the economy or issues on immigration or issues on the cost of petrol, um, they're just irrelevant to us. Well, I'm not interested in them. Uh, and now, as we've uh, mentioned, it's a, it's a state election uh, year, uh, and that obviously uh, allows you to you know, put the maximum amount of pressure on the, the, the politicians. So I'm interested in what your approach, you've mentioned uh, you've got your first rally, uh, what your approach to uh, lobbying politicians will be, because although you have you know, the, the arrogant you know, members of the Andrews government who say, oh, you know, this is you know, just a, a beat up, when it comes to uh, election time, the, the thing that that, you know, will will drive, you know, what a political party's policy is or an MP's attitude is fear of losing mm. their, their their seat. So how do you plan to, you know, uh, yeah. basically, uh, you know, make the most of the election year? I've written to um, all of the Victorian politicians, whether, no matter who they are, um, opposition as well as government, um, I've especially targeted Daniel Andrews, Lisa, um, the Premier, Lisa Neville, the Police Minister, and Martin Pakula, the Attorney General, because they're, they're the people that have, have the big say on the laws, right? Um, they won't meet with us at all to discuss their poli policy initiatives. Um, um, I've asked them if they would speak to some victims who we have on the site. Uh, they haven't even bothered to spend, uh, um, sorry, to spend any time with those victims. Uh, we had a number of the victims in Parliament when Parliament was sitting last year. Daniel Andrews actually walked right past them, um, flatly refused to speak to them, despite them saying, we'd like to talk to you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just goes to show that they're not interested in it. But what we will do, we, we, we've had a few meetings of last year. We've got our policy initiatives designed. And bear in mind, these are just for politicians to look at. They're certainly, I'm not running for, pol for political office and neither is any other person in um, uh, Protect Victoria that I'm aware of. So um, it's, it's all, we're all very non-political. But... Um, we would like to be able to sit down with somebody in the government, one of the three people that I have mentioned, and say, look, these are our policy initiatives, let's do it. Now, they won't do it. They flatly, completely, totally ignore us and especially the victims, which really annoys me. So when you have a look at the last election, and I've just got the figures here, um, there are some Labor people who sit on a mar uh, in marginal seats and sit on 0.5%, 0.7%. Etc. The Premier of Victoria sits on 4.6%. Lisa Neville sits on 4.8%. Uh, uh, the Assistant Deputy Premier James Molino sits on about 5% margin. I mean, these margins will, will be eroded. Anything under about 10, 8% in Australia is a marginal seat now. So here I have a list of um, a whole pile of marginal seats by the ALP and by the Liberal Party for that matter. And we will be targeting the marginal seats, especially those that are held with um, held by the Premier, the Police Minister and the um, Attorney General. And we'll be going right, right out into those seats and just saying to people, you know, at, at rallies in those particular areas, look, guys, in those electorates, don't vote for them because this is what they're doing to us. They, they won't meet us. They, say, they won't even talk to victims of crime. They have no issue in solving these issues. So if you're interested in stopping violent crime occurring in the state of Victoria, then you need to vote for somebody else. Now, whoever they decide to vote for is up to them. But if we put... See, I'm, I'm a great believer in the fact that the only thing a politician listens to is votes, right? If they think that they're going to win votes or lose votes by doing something or not doing something, then they will either not do it or do it, right? Now, if they think the government thinks that it will lose votes by um, um, not sitting down with us, um, not doing something on the um, anti-crime laws, you know, et cetera, et cetera, in the state of Victoria, not toughening them up, then they're going to bend over backwards to um, to do that kind of thing to, to change the laws so that we can all be safe and secure or, or better and 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 they'll just want to keep on um, sort of tightening up the laws. I want to talk to groups like us because you know this is the election year. They, they don't want to be voted out. So if we can put enough pressure on them in their marginal seats, and who knows, they might sit down and talk to us because our preferred option would be our preferred option would be that the government starts changing the laws tomorrow. And, and rein in their cowboy judicial system because 
it's all very well to say, oh, we can always vote them out. But between now and November the 24th this year, mate, there's going to be a lot of people hurt because of our soft on crime policies and they are very lenient judicial system. So we want those laws changed tomorrow. But first of all, we've got to get in and talk to Daniel Andrews or Lisa Neville or uh, Martin Pakula. And that's very hard because, I mean, I guess they know where we're coming from. They know they, they I was told by a Labor person um, who works for one of the ministers that one of the problems that the government has apparently with our group is that it's very, very large. They know that it's growing, but they can't put us in a, they can't pigeonhole us into some box like we're anti-African or we're anti, um, um, you know, we're, we're a bunch of racists or whatever the case may be. They can't pigeonhole us into that area because quite clearly we're not. It was interesting to see that they come out and label some of the other groups getting around as uh, Nazis and stuff like that. Well, I mean, they can't even label us that. We're just a bunch of concerned people, so that bothers them. So hopefully we'll be able to talk to him um, shortly, and I do say shortly because if they want to come out and use our group uh, three weeks, six weeks before the election so they can do a photo shot with us, then um, we just flatly, we just won't meet with them, simple as that. Now, obviously, the the state liberal opposition they're you know wanting to make law and order a key you know focus uh, of their uh, of their campaign, and they've already made uh, a few a few announcements. What's your assessment of what they've put forward so far? Um, they're talking about a lot of mandatory sentencing. Um, herein lies the problem. This is all very good for them to say they want mandatory sentencing for um, for um, those vile crimes such as rape. Um, uh, murder, etc., all these sort of things. But they have not addressed the youth crime policy. I met with the opposition leader some time ago and I, I asked him about his youth crime policy and his statement to me was straight out, oh, we don't have one yet. Um, I would suggest to you they still don't have one. I would further strongly suggest to people that um, they're not game to have a youth crime problem because they do want to appeal to some of the civil libertarians, some of the left-wingers to vote for them. Because this election, yes, whilst um, the Liberal opposition is making it a um, law and order, a, a an election issue, and it will be, there's no doubt about that, um, it's still going to be very, very close because Daniel Andrews uh, manages us to get the civil libertarians on side. And there, there's a lot of them that exist in Australia. Um, so it's still going to be a very tight election. Um, and the Liberal, you know, look, can I say this, that um, the person who once said that, how do you know when a politician's lying? And the answer was, you see his lips moving? Look, that's probably true with all politicians, right, to a certain degree. Matthew Guy, the leader of the opposition, will say exactly what he thinks the people want to hear to get him elected. Now, whether or not he'll be able to introduce those crimes, uh, sorry, those, those laws, um, he probably will for adults. I can't see him introducing um, any laws to combat youth crime, given that he has no policy on dealing with youth crime. I've asked him about youth detention centres. Uh, we don't really have a policy on that. Well, you know, you've got to start deterring the youth. These are where the violent crime, uh, you know, they're the people doing the violent crimes. So they don't have a policy. They might have before the election, but who knows? They might want to talk to us and get a copy of this office. <laughs> Uh, it, it certainly sounds like there's a, a lot that needs to be done to address the the state's crime crisis, and um, you're, you're mm. obviously uh, very knowledgeable on this. You've already done a fair amount of lobbying, so we wish you all the luck uh, for the uh, year ahead. I'll certainly be at your your rally on the uh, 11th of February, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll continue to to grow in support, and uh, hopefully you can uh, continue to harness you know that uh, community uh, concern. Good on you, Tim. Thank you. Pleasure talking, mate. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, as we mentioned in the show, Protect Victoria is holding its first ever public rally on Sunday the 11th of February on the steps of Victoria's Parliament. So if you want the state government to finally take this issue seriously, then make sure you make your way to Melbourne to show your support. Another upcoming event that the Unshackled will be present at is the Free Speech Rally, hosted by the newly formed Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be held in Melbourne at the State Library of Victoria on Saturday the 24th of February at 1pm. It aims to take a stand against the stifling of free speech in Australia, both in our laws and through political correctness, so I hope many of you can make that as well. 
if there isn't enough happening, our friend Dave Palel from Church and State is holding his first major event, the Church and State Summit 2018, on the uh, 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers, including uh, Margaret Court and former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson. I'd also like to remind you once again to vote in their 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 awards with 10 nominees in each category, with the winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. Another two categories have just been posted. There is our Culture Warrior of the Year and our Degenerate of the Year Award. So make sure you have your say. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.